But for now, uh, we have our, our final session, and I'm delighted uh, to be able to introduce Nicholas Gruen, the CEO of Lateral Economics. Uh, Nicholas has uh, a distinguished career in public policy, both as an economist and as an entrepreneur, and as a commentator and an advisor. So we'll be talking about evidence-based policy and its conundrums, and I hand to you, Nicholas. Thank you, Denise. Uh, okay, so this is sort of what I made out of six years in a sense. This is, yeah, what I made out of six years at Taxi, and you've heard a little bit about Taxi from Matt earlier this morning, he tells me. Um, but I guess I uh, went, where, when I joined Taxi, I went from being a tragic liberal, uh, which is the poor will always be with us, we ought to be generous to them. Uh, but it won't make much difference to someone who thinks that properly designed policy can make a reasonable difference, although Tony Abbott is right, I'm afraid to say. Uh, the poor will always be with us. Uh, we can't get this 100% right, but we can do it a lot better than we're doing it. Um, but people talk about evidence-based policy all the time, and a quick answer to my the questions I've posed there, why is progress so slow? Uh, because evidence-based policy is really, really hard and a lot of the people, the most senior pe people who wave their arms around and call for evidence-based policy have no idea that it's hard. They think it's just pretty obvious. Uh, so I'll try and provide you with some contours of that. <coughs> That's an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I should, I'm, I'm tr trying to take about 40 minutes to do that. But if you want to throw Jaffers, which is to say, if you want to interrupt me and uh, uh, dispute what I'm saying or ask me to clarify or anything else, then that's fine. Uh, so, uh, evidence-based policy. We are in an age uh, in which um, this should be the dominant image. Lord Acton said at the turn of the 20th century, that rowing was the perfect preparation for public life because it enables you to go in one direction while you're facing in the other. <laughs> and more and more, as our world becomes more and more complex, that's essentially what's happening. So here, the New South Wales government announced evidence-based policy with great fanfare, and they had an evaluation initiative. And some years later, the independent Auditor General reported that it was largely ineffective. No information is provided on the performance of programs that have been evaluated. Uh, bizarre, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. But that is the world that we are in. That is the world that we are increasingly in. We've just heard how good it is that the Productivity Commission has a bunch of recommendations on open data, on open licensing, on open research. Uh, in 2017, and those largely echo the recommendations of a government inquiry I chaired in 2009, uh, which was called the Government 2.0 Task Force, and all of the significant recommendations were the same and were accepted. So focus on that. Those recommendations were essentially accepted uh, eight years ago. Um, and here we are, they've been made again. Uh, it seems that amnesia is an important precondition to being a senior person, because if you are not that, uh, if you're not amnesiac, you might tell a rather more scary story, that we, ha we are suffering from serial amnesia and the heroes that happen to be at the top of the tree in the next generation may not have the answers. They may be just reciting the mistakes of the previous generation. So um, what do you think this is a picture of? <coughs> I get, usually get two answers. Yeah, everyone thinks it's the brain. It's a, it's, it is what it kind of you first thought it was, which is a river delta. Uh, and my point with the picture is to say that this is an incredibly important and ubiquitous pattern in human and natural life. Here is a tree. 
and it has the same structure. So this is a big deal. And of course, this, uh, if this is a social organisation, it poses all kinds of governance issues. Um, and here is a diagram. I won't tell you what the diagram is because uh, we can just make it a generic diagram and it could be any number of things. Um, so, this is the next part of, your, of my little talk. What is this person doing? Come on. <laughs> Sorry, playing golf wrong. Sorry. Uh, iffy. That person is not playing golf, that person is practising golf. And I, I, I recently thought of using terms which initially turned up in philosophy from Gilbert Ryland in 1969 about thin and thick description and was picked up by anthropologist Clifford Gertz in 1971-72. And thick description is a description of something which leads you to some human understanding of it. It tells you something about context, about motivations, and so on. And it seems to me it's very worthwhile talking about the difference between thin, thick and thin description in policy, thick and thin policy issues. Because there are lots of thin-ish policy issues, um, but here's the thing. We always talk, we are incapable of talking about policy political or policy matters at a high political level without imagining, without thinning them down into apparently thin problems. Uh, so uh, that's my little representation of what a thin policy problem is and uh, some thin policy delivery questions are where top-down policy can work and we have some understanding of what we're doing, tax and family benefit changes. Uh, the, 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 the landscape has been naturalised, if you like. If you read um, Mr Scott, I can't remember his first name, his book, uh, Seeing Like a State, it is the history of the 18th and 19th century and how states came to build the first platforms, if you like, because internet platforms are, pla are places where the thick has become thin, has been systematised so that we can change a dial and everything changes. Uh, so tax and family benefits changes, student loans. We said, why don't we use the tax system to make uh, income contingent student loans? We do something very similar with child support, taking it out of the ramshackle legal system and bringing it into a system that largely works. Uh, stroke of the pen deregulation is a way in which top-down uh, policy making works. Should we have, should we minutely regulate shopping hours? Maybe not. Uh, should we have tariffs and so on? Maybe not. Uh, so, so that all works and yet most policy is not like that at all. Uh, and these are the areas where we now have serial amnesia. These are the areas where there are endless major initiatives uh, announced at high levels uh, that are, have their counterpart in major initiatives that were announced eight years ago four years ago, five years ago, uh, and on and on it goes. Uh, another little thought occurred to me as I defined these two ideas of thick and thin policy is that ideologies are thin, there's nothing wrong with that, issues are thick. So if we come up with an idea like income management in Indigenous communities, it's a simple idea, which is what we won't give you money in order for you to spend it on alcohol. Sounds like a good idea. Turns out it's more complicated than that, that any way that you in introduce it has some major downsides and some upsides. Um, user choice, diversity, core values, individual responsibility and collective responsibility. We throw these things around as if they are the answers to tricky problems in Catherine or uh, in the outer suburbs of Sydney where we have uh, in particular places where families are failing and we grab some of these things and off we go to Q&A and we have a good old, we have a good old ding dong about it. Um, so, um, so that's the way I see things and then we have something else which if you 
detect a certain sinister tone, you're most welcome to. Um, this is a close personal friend of mine, Adam Smith, writing over 200 years ago. This guy was a serious guy, trust me. Uh, and this is a remarkable thing for a person who's known as a champion of wealth and privilege and so on, pretty much the opposite of the way he thought, that the dis disposition to admire and almost worship the rich and powerful is the most universal cause of corruption of our moral sentiments. Quite a statement. And think about that in our world of capillaries and arteries, because the thing is that the arteries are in some sense more important than capillaries. Uh, and the arteries in a bureaucracy or any kind of system are typically much more powerful than the capillaries. And so it is in our governments uh, that this is replicated absolutely. And to put it simply, nobody with any ambition wants to go into delivery because that's not where the action is, that's not where the money is, that's not where the promotion is, that's certainly where the hazards are, because you can actually be in charge of something that goes badly wrong. But the policy architects that gave us vet fee help are happily rummaging their way through the uh, hierarchy of the public service uh, with, with uh, nary, a, uh, with, with nary a, a problem. In fact, I was at a conference in Ireland not so long ago where Yanis Varoufakis defined a, an establishment. An establishment is uh, a group of people who create a problem and then insist that they're the only ones who can solve it. Um, and here's this exactly the same kind of uh, exactly the same kind of observation made from Canada. This is a completely ubiquitous phenomenon. I've taken to saying that it's like Marie Antoinette's hats, which is to say that quite mysteriously, uh, although here it's not that mysterious, we can see the incentives that work here, but quite mysteriously we get caught up in global fashions. Um, and certainly the global fashion for metrics treating academics like lab rats in a Skinner box uh, has taken over the world. And it's just extraordinary how few universities and research organisations stand outside of that and say that's actually not our idea of how to do things, even when some of them have got $36 billion endowments and don't need any favours from anywhere. Really quite amazing. That was an aside, I guess. <laughs> Marie Antoinette's hats, just think about it. So here we have a picture, and I'm just wondering what's going to come up next. There we are. Uh, and we have policy up here and then we have delivery down there. And our problem, ladies and gentlemen, is that learning mostly needs to go upward. Uh, but we don't want to play that game. Uh, so, um, so that's our problem, and there's, a, there's an anomalous delivery unit which I'll tell you about later on. Uh, and this is what's happening to incentive structures. This is academia, and that blue line at the top is central administration. These are wages. This has happened in academia, uh, has happened in business, of course, uh, has happened in the bureaucracy, where the highest paid um, CEOs, uh, I think it's true of the uh, head of the Prime Minister, Prime Minister and Cabinet, it's certainly true of the head of the Reserve Bank, are paid more than a million dollars. Um, and alongside this, with everybody heading to become their favourite artery, we have one area of dysfunction after another. There's a, um, here's regulation review, something I've talked about for a long time, and those are so just a few quotes from that report that I quoted you earlier on. A nice top-down measure was, is called one, one in, one out, or one on, two off. For every regulation you have, you have to get rid of two. Well, that's easily gamed. You get rid of regulation on how you need to maintain flax ropes on ships. Uh, you can get rid of a lot of those, uh, which are not doing any harm. And the, the upshot is that, uh, as you can see at the bottom there, legislative complexity increased under the program of one on, two off. Um, in IT, 
uh, endless policy. This is now a quote from a guy who was part of the government digital service in the UK, which actually seemed to have made some progress with these issues uh, by trying to focus on users, and by users they meant users, not departmental users and so on. Uh, that's a nice little diagram of the relationship between average budget overshoot for IT uh, and size of project uh, compared with lower down the average construction budget overshoot. Clearly major problems in governance. Um, but it also tells you where you would head um, if uh, you would like to be, you know, I think being at the top of these systems is a lot better than being at the bottom. Um, here's our PISA performance. This is a thick problem. How do you teach students? How do you educate students? A thick problem. And Australia is starting, to, having done very well on it, is starting to do surprisingly badly on that thick problem. Um, health. Uh, here is the report which, well actually this is from a speech by Peter Harris before he produced the report which rehearsed a lot of our recommendations. Uh, but it really is quite, as he said, these are pretty disgraceful things. These are small things that go on that are completely dysfunctional and that we could agree are dysfunctional. Uh, and we heard earlier about Cal Co Copyright Agency Limited negotiating with libraries. I'm a declaration of interest. I'm a patron of the Australian Digital Alliance, which uh, Derek is involved with, and I think Cal are an evil, uh, <laughs> an evil, what is, what was Ronald Reagan's? An evil empire. Um, and uh, so there's the declaration of interest, but these issues, and it was good to see that some progress had been made, but it's an amazing idea of progress that you go into a room with the rent seekers and then say, please, please, can I have something? And that's been going on for decades and a little bit has been given. But we know it's not good policy. We know that the policy arguments are much more strongly on the side of fair use than fair dealing. Um, so we are, ladies and gentlemen, in a world which we used to look down upon and which we saw in foreign aid, which is the cult of announceables leaves us with lots of shiny assets which are then not maintained because maintaining assets is not announceable. Uh, and um, here is a nice study put out earlier this year by the Institute for Government in the UK, uh, in which documents um, a, just a remarkable state of affairs. So the Department of Further Education or the agencies involved in further education had 48 CEOs, have had 48 CEOs since 1981. Pretty obviously, if you're dealing with a thick problem that you have to learn and experiment and build on experience, 48 CEOs pretty much rules out what you're trying to achieve right there. And that is replicated in all sorts of other areas. So that's kind of where we are at the moment. Um, and in Australia, these typically happen in lower status areas, often areas that are given high status in aspirational types of comments, but actually uh, don't give governments any real heartache at election time. And that's what has happened in Aboriginal policy uh, uh, over the last little while. So evidence-based programs, I'm going to talk about evidence, I'm going to separate out evidence-based delivery from evidence-based policy. Uh, I'm going to talk about delivery first, and I think I can truncate this a little bit. I'm keeping an eye on my time. I've gone about 20 minutes. I've got another 20 minutes. Uh, and I was going to talk to you about family by family, which you have been introduced to by Matt. Uh, family by family is a very different way of doing things. How many things in your life that r really important life skills did you learn outside an empathic bond? Uh, I suspect not many. And yet our whole social protection system is built around the idea that, well, we'll just have to because we've got a whole lot of professional people that we're employing and they fit in with our system and we'll just kind of keep turning the handle. Uh, so we built a family intervention program which was based around uh, the mentorship of families. And for me, it's very important 
not to just say that you've got these two worlds of professionals delivering services and the life world, sort of um, a sort of sentimental picture in which people are all working this stuff out for themselves. This is a program that has been, a lot of work's gone into designing it, experimenting with different bits of it, and it is coached by a trained coach. It's not just a bunch of people who can sort it all out for themselves. Uh, that's a great video. If, if Matt didn't show it to you, then that's terrible and I won't have time. Um, so, um, this, is a, this is an image that I started with on, my, on the front slides and it's a big problem. And you may have heard that joke that is made about economists on a desert island with some cans of food and the, there's an engineer and a, somebody and an economist and the economist's final answer is assume a can opener. And here, the problem with this situation is that we assume a market. So the metaphor of a market, which of course should never be forgotten about because markets are possibly our one miraculous way of dealing with social and economic problems when they work well, and it's hardly surprising they don't work well bringing up children. We certainly should be thinking about markets, but we shouldn't be saying anything that looks more like a market must be better than something that looks less like a market. We need to try to interrogate these things on their merits. We need to try and understand what the problems are and so on. So what evidence do we want when we hear um, evidence-based policy? Firstly, we want da data on what causes what. So a great deal of very rich evidence is not causal evidence. As a quick rule of thumb, if it's not evidence about something that you varied, either at random or in some other way, it's probably not causal evidence. So it's not that much use to you. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the first thing. There are a whole lot of ways, this, this is from this book, uh, a whole lot of ways in which we're after a small subset of evidence. We want that evidence to address policy concerns at hand. We want it constructed in ways to exp which are useful to address a policy concern, evidence applicable to the logical, to, to the local context. These slides you can get later if you would like. Um, so that's where we're at. Then there's just, you just make up constraints as you go along. One of the constraints is a political constraint, of course, and that political constraint might be over there and then you're in a bit of a pickle, aren't you? So um, that's, that's, the, that's a sort of quick look at that. Here's my friend Martin Parkinson again telling us all to be more evidence-based. Now I haven't asked this question of Martin Parkinson but I have asked it of very many of his deputies in his own department and elsewhere and I say to them, do you know what program logic is? And they don't. So they go around the country saying we should have more evidence-based policy and they don't know what evidence-based policy is because if you don't know anything about program logic, you're not really in the hunt. So let me tell you a little bit about what I mean by program logic. That is a program logic from a health program. It could be a program logic from um, family by family and it goes from inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes. These are all hypotheses. We think that talking to families in this way rather than that way will engender more confidence, which will mean that these things will happen. And at any one of these, firstly, you never really know with the sort of with the sort of confidence you might in a scientific experiment how right you are about this, uh, and and it's a very complicated story. And so, um, and so, what we're trying to do is we. If we are evidence-based about this program, we go about investigating its program logic. We go about trying to understand it, trying to work out where we can optimise it and so on. And we make, even then, pretty Herculean assumptions. Um, but what our evidence-based policy people, the people waving their arms around saying we want to be more evidence-based, mostly mean is we want a stamped university study which says that this is an independent evaluation even though they're entirely relaxed about the fact that the independent evaluation was commissioned by the agency that was trying to prove its own efficacy. 
absolutely hopeless, okay? Nobody's trying here, okay? Nobody's really even trying. We're all going through the motions. Do you detect a certain amount of passion in what I'm saying? Um, and randomised controlled trials. That's got to be scientific. That's just great. Don't they do that with medicine? So randomised controlled trials are the trinket of the age. Uh, and here are all the Nobel Prize winners and others. Actually, only one Nobel Prize winner. There are two, three, no, two Nobel Prizes here who say, amongst other people, who say that's absolute nonsense. Of course, randomised trials can be very useful, uh, but they're a small part of the solution. RCTs are thin. They give you very simple information. They tell you with a high degree of plausibility that this thing caused that outcome because we've got a control group in that situation at that time. It, they don't tell you what would happen if you changed this little bit here or why any of it happened. So uh, I like this quote from Frederick Hayek. Uh, wrote that in 1942. Demands and further attempts to be scientific in social research are still presented to us as the latest revolutionary in innovations which, if adopted, will secure rapid, undreamed of progress. Ladies and gentlemen, this is hard and it's not the case that if you adopt little trinkets of things that look scientific, you will get anywhere much at all. You'll simply participate in the cycle of amnesia and remembering. Uh, so we, an RCT is effectively taking that process and doing that with it. It can be a valuable thing. And it's certainly the case that we want to experiment and, and vary a lot of things. Uh, and that's, in fact, I'll skip that, except have the, my little tagline there. Um, uh, and, um, and say that university-funded reports, again, can be useful, but they're a very small part of this. And remember what uh, Amazon and Google are saying, which is vary lots of things, find out what changes what, become knowledgeable about what you're doing, become knowledgeable and intentional about what you're doing. Uh, and you could, guess what? Nobody could get a peer-reviewed journal article out of any of this stuff. I mean, they probably could because it's secret and that would be exciting for people and they publish it. But it's not highly intellectual stuff. It's simple work a day, what's working, why, and so on. Uh, so now I want to talk about evidence-based policy. Uh, and I'm thinking of something like family by family because what's happened is I was involved in family by family when it first came to, into existence and for the last three or four years it's been in four suburbs in South Australia and one suburb in Sydney and it either should be rolled out uh, much more widely than that and grown or it should be shut down. But of course our system has no way of really making any of those decisions. It's just a nice program that sits there. Um, these are the things that I want to suggest to you are good things to have in evidence and it's a nice list. Sorry, it's in red, it might be a bit hard to read. Um, but it's a nice list, it's a nice illustration of how hard this is because it's really hard to get evidence that meets all these criteria. Um, and remember that story I told you about with this rogue uh, outfit. Well, this is, rep this is a little diagrammatic representation of an initiative in a particular state of Australia where the child protection system, it was decided it would be really good if we could reintroduce children who'd been taken off their parents back to their parents. That's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Because the parents haven't been too good the first time around and what do we know about how they're going to be in the second time around? So around the state, as everybody took the instruction from on high, the success rate was 30% in the offices around this state um, and lots of, there was lots of gnashing of teeth, of course. Uh, but one unit m took this as a challenge, took it as a challenge to learn which children were more, w w where this would work better, where it would work less well. 
And over a period of time, they built a system in which they had an 85% success rate, up from 30%. But by the time they'd done that, the, the program was, this idea was largely discredited bureaucratically. So, of course, the whole thing was restructured. And, of course, that group that had managed to make a success of the program were disbanded. And the people up at the policy end never knew anything about it. Uh, and we discovered it in our investigations. Um, I suspect that story, shocking as it is, is not that surprising to people who know how these systems work. So, um, institutionalising evidence-based policy. Anyone know what this crest is? It's from 1660. It's the Royal Society and the motto is nullius in verba, except nothing by word because it's a motto for the new scientific age of testing everything. And so, in a sense, what they're trying to do is they're trying to put new science on it, to use a modern cliche, on a level playing field with the installed base of science. And they're saying, I don't care who said it, I don't care if it was Aristotle and if there's angels pulling the planets around, if I can't verify that, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not really interested. So the first thing that that leads me to argue is that in this little part of the department, um, we should, uh, because evaluation is a difficult thing, uh, it's a really hard thing to do, and I don't want to propose, propose myself as an expert in evaluation, I'm just an observer from outside and a respectful observer from outside respectful of how much these people know, I think the way to do it is to have some kind of centrally funded, um, uh, some kind of centrally funded provision of evaluation. Um, and it is also independent. So you now have a, a demarcation of incentives, one to perform, the other to report on what's happening and to know what's happening. And I think that's extremely healthy. Uh, it's trying to encourage self-transparency and, based on that, a larger kind of system transparency. And, of course, if you look... This is, a, I, I, this is Warren Buffett, you probably know that, and he has a term which is the institutional imperative which he applies to his own world of business. And the imperative there is that businesses' imperative is to grow, not to use capital in the best possible way. And in government, there are institutional imperatives. I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Here is a market responding to a new technology. This is a market, a market for smartphones. Nokia is doing very nicely, and then a better technology comes along, and Nokia starts making fewer phones because it can't sell them. Uh, and that's not what happens in family support. When you have a better way of providing family support, who's going to make that happen? Uh, so, right there, you've got a problem. And again, I'm going to quote Peter Shergold, uh, and, and this is part of the answer, just part of the reason why bits of innovation are happily funded on the edge of systems, but never really come to, again, to use a cliched word, disrupt the larger story. Um, and here's our friend in a marketplace. Now, consider family by family. I call that a human capital intervention, builds a, a, or a social capital intervention. And the thing about a social capital in intervention is that it's like something which makes the body healthier. It radiates good things. A whole system becomes healthier. So, in fact, uh, if you think about the benefits that this generates, it's funded, if this thing works, it's funded... No, it doesn't. It's funded within... A t from a tiny part of the public purse that represents some of the good that it does. Uh, and, you know, it's perfect, you know, some of the benefit is private, so that's fine, that accrues to people. Uh, much of the benefit is social and hard to understand how you could ever fund that. Um, uh, some of it's within the portfolio. It has a family by family, has a, it would seem, a strong effect on domestic violence, but it's not funded from domestic violence. And then there are all these extra portfolio effects. Now, 
I had, while I was a taxi, I had this expression which was family by family as a platform. Because we noticed that a lot of children were not diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, but there are a lot of autism spectrum disorder units around the outer suburbs where you can take your kids and nobody does. And our mentoring families were identifying this and taking families along to these centres and they were feeling hugely transported in, they were enraptured as one is often in getting a diagnosis about a thing that has been driving you crazy and driving your anxiety levels way up for years and years and years. So just think of the thought experiment. Imagine other services being delivered through family by family. What would it mean? It would mean a lot of things. It would mean a lot of redesign. It would mean making some mistakes. Maybe it's a bad idea. But those are the kinds of things we could be exploring. But we're not doing any of those things. And one of the reasons we're not doing any of those things is that we imagine a market. We imagine that all of these things are known product categories, so we can either privatise or corporatise and then just sit there looking at the dashboard and say, I'll have more of those because those things work and we'll have less of those things because those things don't work, even though that's not even what we do. But, but that's, how, uh, that's how different things could be but how they can't be that way and we're not even close to imagining those possibilities when we think we're a kid in a candy store. Okay, so where am I now? Um, so the next thing is to say that here are these new, th this, this new practice and then there's the installed base. Then there's all the people who've got their careers and got their lines to their professional associations and their and the politicians and the minister needs to know that if a child dies, if we're in child support, if a child dies, the minister needs to know that there's a process of providing ministerial advice where the minister can stand up in parliament and say, it wasn't my fault, it was the opposition's fault, and this is the reason. Uh, and these units over there on the right-hand side don't have any of those things. So the business, so the installed base has all these advantages of incumbency. So what I would like to see is that evaluation occurs independently on a level playing field between the new and the old. Uh, and uh, we have been, our, some, our friends in Canada have, there's a group of evaluators and I guess economic, you know, the, the science of public choice would suggest that there's no surprises in this. Evaluators have come out with, a, with a, an advocacy for an evaluator general. Uh, and um, uh, they don't think the auditor general can do that job and neither do I, because an auditor general is a compliance focused officer, an auditor general is a top down kind of deliverer of services. And what I'm proposing, and this is a little different to the Canadians, I'm proposing this idea of separation of knowing what you're doing with doing what you're doing. That's a fundamentally it. It's not about top-down. It's not about new accountabilities. It's about new uh, ways of conceiving of self-transparency, if you like. So I want to move that unit outside the department uh, give it some independence, give it some funding uh, and have it reporting to two people or to two places into the organisation to help it lift its game. So this is data, this is uh, monitoring evaluation material that is designed to be useful to do a better job, not just for accountability. And it goes up and out and, it won and the report is to Parliament and therefore to the public, not to a minister, uh, or only notionally to a minister. So it goes quite a lot beyond the Canadian idea of an evaluator general, which then sort of federates down and everybody has their own evaluation uh, system within government agencies. I think we should separate out these two things. And the way in which I define those two systems is these are systems for the direct provision of public goods and we have lots of them. They deliver things like integrity, the Auditor General. We don't have a different minister coming in and saying, I'm going to tell the Auditor General to do a whole lot of different things. 
The Auditor General does the same thing no matter what party is in power. The, the Auditor General, the Ombudsman, with information we have the ABS. Uh, knowing what we're doing we, and understanding policy choices, we have things like the, piece, uh, the PC and now the Parliamentary Budget Office, which the opposition or the shadow treasurer, Chris Bowen, has for a long time argued should be where we do our budget forecasts from. Why wouldn't you do that? Why isn't the, what, the, uh, the, the working of the public service on budget forecasts and what different things cost, why isn't that a public good available to us all rather than secretly handed to the treasurer and then massaged for the benefit of others? And then we have competitive provision on which our Westminster system works and that is, remains necessary for delivering services and also for making choices, advising the minister, minister, you could do that, we think it would be best if you did this for these reasons. And it's also appropriate that that be secret to some extent because of the hysterical nature of our media. Um, so that's another, that's a list again of the good things to have. Um, and the one thing, the one thing I want to say here is while I've painted a big picture, you don't have to start big because of course if you want, if you want to think I'm just saying we have to do, do what I say here, well no one's going to do it. So there are lots of small ways to get going on this. I've sort of shown you how by starting within a department and separating out the idea of evaluation and delivery. Uh, and so essentially that's, that's the message as far as growing this. Anyone can do it. Uh, I think we should have identify some priority sectors. I gave a similar lecture at LSC recently and the UK have got things like a lo loneliness agenda which we could do with uh, and they're trying to focus more directly on well-being, which we should also do. Uh, but uh, those are two somewhat nationally distinguished agendas. Uh, and you could set some system targets and then ask in for independent reporting on them in, say, three years' time by the Auditor General to try and get over the amnesia problem. Uh, so that is um, what I have to offer you. And um, you are welcome to... Take a copy of those slides and do whatever you wish with them, including misrepresent them in any way that a media outfit would feel free to. And uh, that is the end of what I have to say, and I'm very happy to take questions. I'll kick off with the first question, if you don't mind, Nicholas. Um, we've, we've heard throughout the day about the the tension between optimism about joined up government, joined up solutions, and a pragmatic understanding of where government policy, research, and infrastructure are fractured, and in some instances broken. Mm. How does that fit with initiatives like analysis and policy observatory with the optimism built into it for joining up, joining up knowledge, joining up information, and providing a resource and a platform? The optimism about, about joined up government, the optimism about joined up research infrastructure and, and, and information, are you as um, disenchanted about the platform for information as you are about the policy process? Um, uh, kind of, yes, I think I am. I'm certain, I mean, the, the, I, this isn't about APO. I mean, APO is a fine initiative, but, and I'm thinking more about economics than areas like social policy, which I know, which I'm less immersed in the literature. But at the very level of university activity, university activity is oriented around outputs. And outputs in academic journals are largely dedicated to building the discipline. And um, there's lots of ways you can build a discipline which are of no use to anyone. If you're doing public policy, you could have endless discussions about what the new public management is, and, and there are now 14 different schools. You know, you say, well, Giddens argues that it's this, and somebody else argues that it's that. You can get articles published on that. It's completely useless, as in my opinion. Um, and so, you know, this is a really seriously problematic. This is seriously problematic. As I was saying to somebody earlier on, um, 
And, you know, I, I, I realise it's, it's sort of... One is naturally suspicious of somebody who's so down on so many things as me. Um, I would be. Uh, <laughs> But now I've forgotten the point I was going to make. Um, damn. See, it's the secret Optimism of Optimism about joined up in information. Have you got any? Um, oh, well, uh, no, well, well, no, I was trying to make a slightly different point. Um, yeah, well, well, it's, it's uh, yeah, so I that's right. I said to this person, I, my father was an academic in a, in a more innocent time. Uh, I didn't go into academia because I could sort of see what was happening. Um, but I think what we've done over the last 40 or 50 years is we've gone from an inefficient and effective system to an efficient and ineffective system. Uh, and I prefer the former to the latter, and of course I would like to see an efficient and effective system. But efficiency is much easier than effectiveness, particularly when you're trying to think of hard things. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to... You know, this, none of this stuff is easy. The brightest minds in the world are working away on it. But it's easy to be efficient. You just sort of get everyone's KPIs, don't really worry too much about whether they match up to anything much, and crank the handle. And that's kind of what we've done. And just like Marie Antoinette's hats, everyone's doing it. See, I've got it here. Hi. Um, yeah, well, I have some cause for optimism in, in all of this, in that um, I guess I do a lot of work where I go in at the community level mm. and the delivery level, I suppose that would be. And um, I did a project recently all across Victoria, and I was actually kind of stunned at the level of innovation that was going on. Mm. A bit like you were talking about your family by family. Mm. Um, all across the state, there are things going on that are really effective. Yeah. Um, and I guess I was, I was kind of struck by two things. One was, why were they not diffusing these good things among each Which other? Which I was sort of trying to <laughs> show yeah, you something about Yeah, and the that. other was really, how, how are they managing to do this different innovation in all these different places? And it turned out that they have, in Victorian health services at least, an element of block funding that enables them to do innovation. And so, well, to me, that was, that was a really significant um, thing. It allowed them to do place-based mm. things in terms of um, what they thought were the, were the local priorities. So I suppose a, a couple of points, really. One is, um, and they seem to be kind of working around all this macro stuff that you're kind of talking about. Um, so, so one is kind of like, do we know enough about how this whole ecosystem works? Do we know enough about how policy actually and great ideas and innovation diffuse at, at the delivery level and how that, how that kind of gets up and eventually somehow influences macro policy? Um, no, well, we never will. But, <laughs> but we know quite a lot. I mean, we know in a descriptive way, and these things uh, change a lot over time anyway. I mean, you know, a new prime minister, a new minister, lots of things change. So... Um, so you know, there are people who know quite a lot. They won't all agree, but I don't think we... There's nothing to, there's nothing to wait to know more about anything. We know enough about the system to know things about what's good about it, things about what's bad about it. Way, uh, people can take positions on incremental and other types of changes that might improve it somewhat, and if you don't agree, then you can do it over here and somebody else can try something over there. So, so we know enough to do all of those things. I mean, on the optimism-pessimism question, I, I'm kind of optimistic about what's happening on the ground. I'm very optimistic about people's capacity to figure stuff out. I'm even optimistic about democracy, and I talk quite a lot about that, because we're really pretty smart people and still an open society. But by God, things are in a terrible mess up the top. And that's true in democracy, and I think it's true here too. Um, so, but, but, but as for optimism versus pessimism, I just think of... Um, Woody Allen in um, Annie Hall, where his mother comes into the kitchen and says to his father, have it your own way, the Atlantic Ocean's a better ocean than the Pacific Ocean. You know, I mean, am I optimistic or pessimistic? There are lots of opportunities to do great things. It's very frustrating that lots of great things don't just naturally come into their own, but that's, that's the world that we're in. Um, I want to 
pick up on the comment that you made, I think it was Martin Parkinson's, about opportunities only half seized. Because... Um, uh, 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 Peter Shergold. Okay. Yeah. Um, because I can probably give... He, he's, sorry, he's an ex... Secretary of PMNC, yes. which is different to being the Secretary of PMNC, okay. like, pri Fair like Prime Ministers anyway, and ex Prime Ministers. The point is about the half seas. So yes, because I can probably give you just off the top of my head five examples in healthcare of of evidence based and tested models that have not been faithfully implemented. Yeah. In part, be, in that mostly because not enough resources have been provided. I mean, the classic example is Headspace. So the government initially was won over, funded Headspace, all went off great, So, it, but every time they've funded them since in two or three different budgets, they've given out less money per Headspace operation mm. than the last time. I, I suppose you could argue that it's kind of working, mm. but uh, I mean, so they're, perhaps they're getting value for money, I don't think they've actually properly evaluated they wouldn't know. it. Um, but they're not getting the value for money that they were supposed to be getting on the basis of the evidence-based model. So how yep. do you get around that? Well, that's my model of the evaluator general is my way of trying to get around that. So we live in a democratic society and politicians will do whatever they do and that's kind of the way it should be uh, if we think they're democratically elected. What I want to do is when... If Headspace is a, is a program that works well, I want the evaluator general to be, you know, like like um, an ocean liner pumping out uh, information, pumping stuff out of its funnels, which are telling us, yes, that program's going well. And then um, uh, there's a plan in the budget to reduce funding by 20% with some blather, which is to say we're very, we're very pleased with the progress it's made and this has created a, you know, the sort of thing. This has created the ability to reduce expenditure and we're, we're um, reliably informed that this will continue to be a very effective program. And then the Evaluator General will put out... I mean, I don't want the Evaluator General to get into a, an oppositional stance, but the Evaluator General can be asked a question by the opposition or of its own accord, say, our modelling of this program is that it generates these kinds of benefits, so this 20% reduction in funding will, in five years' time, involve this much more hospital expenditure, this much more expenditure on remedial reading, uh, and so on. And so you are trying to level up the playing field um, and you're trying to get transparency working, but you're actually building the institutions from the ground up so that it's not uh, a PR show. Because most of what we've got in the public realm is a form of PR. Any independent evaluation which was commissioned by the agency being evaluated is a is some variant on PR and most of the stuff is like that. And, and because at least in mental health people are so grateful to have some money yes. they don't want to look a gift That's horse right. in the mouth. That's right. And I also think that imagine I was reading a I was reading a speech by Baroness Lister, would you believe? Don't know why. And she's a social justice crusader in the United Kingdom as is her right and good on her. And it was all and it was about um, the pressure that families can uh, come under when they're disadvantaged and all this sort of stuff. And as I read it, what struck me was there was nothing in it about what we could do and whether it would work. And I have this secret idea that the um, Growing jealousy of the community in funding uh, social welfare and so on is partly because people have been quite successful at showing ways in which that expenditure is managed in a pretty dysfunctional way, in ways in which that expenditure doesn't generate the sort of outcomes that people would like to see it. Back when we didn't know that in the 1960s, Lyndon Johnson was able to announce a war, not on drugs, not on terror, but on poverty. And people bought into it, and they bought into it with higher preparedness to pay tax. Average tax rates went up strongly in line with the war on poverty. So 
that's another thing which I was talking to Joe earlier about our, our politics cannot do that because our politics requires everything to be litigated as a culture war. You pick which side you're on, whether you're on the side of hard-working Australian families who want lower electricity prices and are sick of being ripped off and lied to, or you're on the side of disadvantaged families, and your side's going to... And, and once you've picked your side, they're all good. They're just the salt of the earth, these people. And the other side are not caring, nasty bunch. And you just have a good old ding-dong. And on Q&A, you'll have one person on one side and one on the other. And whenever somebody threatens to go outside that discourse, Tony Jones says, I'll take that as a comment. Next question. Um, that's, that's, that's how it all works. Um, just one, one aside on this from another, another one of my passions, which is democracy. Some of you may know there was recently an election in Austria. A little party that's promoting the idea of citizens' juries, that's a somewhat misleading way of characterising them, um, but the best I can do in a sentence, did a survey of a thousand... Ran uh, of a, a stratified survey, like a poll, of a thousand representative Austrians, and they took them aside and they showed them the portfolio, portfolios of the... Um, 26 departments of state, so uh, health, defence, immigration, education and so on. And they said, which of these areas do you think it's most important for our politicians to focus on in the next term of parliament, whatever parliament is called in Austria? I'm ashamed to say I don't know. Um, and the answer, and the high, guess what the highest, guess, guess what came first? in that calm survey. Come on. What would you guess might come first? Education. education. It was education. Most people guess education. That's what came first. Immigration came forth. The election was held on immigration because you can't sell newspapers talking about education. There's no culture war in it. In it. Well, there's a bit of a culture war, but it's not exciting enough. So this is very deep. This is a really terrible situation. Um, there. OK, I think we have time for just one more quick question and one quick answer before it's drinks. So, last one. Uh, hi, Ginny Barber from the Australian Open Access Support Strategy Group. Um, so my question is, I'm, I'm going to defend clinical trials here, actually. Um, I well, was I don't think there's any point. We all defend clinical trials. They're a good idea. Can I, can I make... Okay. Let me finish my point. So my training originally is in haematology a long time ago. And the most effective clinical, tri clinical trials in my... my I think probably were ever done, actually, was a set of trials within the UK for childhood leukaemia. So every child within the UK who got leukaemia, I think it's still the case now, certainly was when I was training, was entered into a clinical trial. And so the trials got smaller and smaller and smaller. They started with really big questions and ended up with tiny, tiny questions, like, you know, what was your likelihood of relapsing in the brain if you're a boy between 7 and 10? You know, tiny, tiny things. Every time they did a clinical trial, you know, they got, a sm they got an answer. So the evidence base got stronger and stronger. What happened was there was a kind of multi-generational thing amongst academics, amongst clinicians, about the need for this evidence to be really robust. And it was kind of within the culture. So my question to you is, I absolutely agree. It's individual clinical trial, too, too small. How do we replicate that within the public policy sphere? Because that's what leads to great evidence in whatever sphere it is. And I've never seen that in any other setting, except in IC, actually in one other area of medicine. But, uh. Well, I'm not very well equipped to tell you how to replicate it in health. But... Yeah, but my point is that it's worth asking the question, how do you replicate it in health? It's a misleading question in policy. Because there is no, because in health, if you're dealing with leukaemia, you're dealing with a physical system, a massively complex physical system, but a physical system which is replicable. We are going to assume that every child is like every other child until we find out that they're not, because then we go into genetic di differences between children. But we're dealing with an essential with a, a system which is in principle knowable. Now that's completely different to what happens in a school. 
in a school, you, nev you will never know exactly, you will never be able to strip these things down to non-interactive components because they are interactive components. But that's the whole point of randomization is that you don't, you randomize so, because not everybody is the same. So actually I have seen very good trials done in, in schools actually where you know, you've got robust results. So I, I just feel it's a little bit of a myth that you can't apply that methodology so, to policy. So do you know, are you aware of the, I mean we know something, I mean it's a bit of a, a you know, the, the things feed back on themselves so you get a bit of an echo chamber, but there is a reasonable amount of consensus about school systems that are very successful. They're not full of randomised trials. There's no randomised trials anywhere in sight. There are empowered professional and purveyors of craft, uh, empowered to do their best and also empowered to understand as best they can what they're doing. Um, that's only a talking point from me. That doesn't tell you the next layer down. But um, by all means, just like markets are a powerful idea, randomised controlled trials are a powerful idea. Do lots of, um, do lots of um, randomised experiments which take an afternoon rather than three months. That's how Amazon and these sorts of things... So, so absolutely do those kinds of things. But that's quite different to the sort of, um, the, the sort of mindset that you're appealing to when you talk about the treatment of leukaemia. That's a very different, that's a very different story. Don't you think? No, we might have to disagree. I, I think because okay. they're just experiments. A trial is an experiment. I yes, just but it's an experiment with a with a with a system which is in principle replicable. That's the point. It's in principle replicable. You cannot um, the 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 amount of variation you can uh, you can have um, outside of all kinds of much vaguer notions of kind of the health of a community, the health of a family. You can't vary little things. You can't, you, you, can, you can uncover, if you've got better data, you can uncover interesting facts like single fathers do better in certain respects or perhaps with sons than daughters in certain ways and not in other ways. But you can't get down to the real facts or really what works in the same kind of way that you can with leukaemia. Okay, we might have I to think disagree. I think we <laughs> we might disagree, um, but it just goes to show that robust debate is alive and well around the room. Uh, am I wrapping up, or are you saying a word, Amanda? But I'll say first, thank you so much for for a stimulating and provocative thank presentation. You. Someone else, someone else was saying how great APO was, but I was very impressed to see the APO corporate gear getting out. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's, that's pretty cool.